All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. My name is Eddie Watson, and make sure you guys subscribe to the channel if you want to get more videos like this video here. Now, in this lesson here today, we are going to be taking a look at a medication that has played an important role in critical care for a very long time. It has a role in our ACLS in treating bradycardia, uh, as well as it also has an impact on our patients in shock. So let's go ahead and get started talking about dopamine. All right, so dopamine is another medication at our disposal that really has a multitude of effects around the body. I'm always intrigued and fascinated by the varied effects of some of the medications that we use, even when we're using them for very specific purposes. So let's get in and let's actually talk about what exactly dopamine is. So dopamine is actually an endogenous catecholamine. It has a very important role as a neurotransmitter in our brain, but it also has effects throughout the body. Now, naturally in the body, dopamine is actually a precursor to norepinephrine, which itself is a precursor to epinephrine. So I'm actually going to put up a couple pictures of the molecular structure of these three molecules because they are quite similar, and I really find this quite fascinating. Now, as far as the dopamine that we know, we know it in the form of an intravenous medication. Now, this intravenous medication, dopamine, doesn't actually cross the blood-brain barrier, so we don't see those effects of it as a neurotransmitter within the brain. And we're primarily using it for its effects that have controls on the periphery of the body. So let's actually talk about those controls and really how it is that dopamine works. Now, dopamine primarily affects the following receptors. We have our dopamine receptors. We have our beta adrenergic receptors, and this is going to be our beta-1 and our beta-2 receptors. And then we have our alpha adrenergic receptors, and this is primarily going to be our alpha-1 receptor. Now, for our dopamine receptors, uh, these don't really play a big role in our use of dopamine. Uh, they're located on smooth muscle, proximal renal tubules, and collecting ducts, and this actually can lead to uh, increased diuresis from the kidneys. Now, beta-1, though, this one actually plays a very important role. Now, in the heart, this is actually going to lead to increased chronotropy as well as increased inotropy. And so what this means is, if we remember, we have our cardiac output equation. So this is cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. Now, in the case of this beta-1 activation, we're going to be increasing both our heart rate and both our stroke volume through the increased contractility. And so we're going to be affecting both components of this cardiac output equation, and thus we're going to see increased output, which is going to lead to increased perfusion. Now, the beta-1 activation also plays a role in the kidneys, as this is going to stimulate the release of renin. Now, this is going to lead to a cascade of events that ultimately is going to lead to increased blood volume, thanks to our angiotensin II and our aldosterone. Now, for our beta-2 activation, um, while not heavily influenced by dopamine here, uh, the effects of this receptor are primarily seen in the bronchial smooth muscle relaxation, which leads to dilation of airways. Now, for our alpha-1 receptor activation, the primary effects here are seen in the constriction of our vascular smooth muscle. Now, it does also have an effect in myocardial tissue leading to increased inotropy as well. Now, another interesting, fascinating thing about dopamine is that the effects that we see from it are often dose-dependent. And so what this means is, at lower doses, so if we have doses that are less than 10 micrograms per kilogram per minute, that we're going to typically see more beta adrenergic stimulation. Whereas if we're at higher doses, so think greater than 10, we're going to see a shift to more of that alpha adrenergic activation. Now this is also interesting because there was some belief for quite some time that at lower doses, so in the 0.5 to 2 micrograms per kilogram per minute range, that the effects of the dopamine receptors in the kidneys and the spleen would actually have uh, positive effects. And this kind of led to the adoption of low dose or something that you may have heard referred to as renal dose dopamine. But there's actually been many studies over the years that really have shown that there's no benefit to this. And in fact, there might even be some potential negative effects. 
Now, dopamine has a very short half-life. It only lasts about one to five minutes in the blood, so we're actually going to be using this medication as a continuous infusion, and we're most often going to find dopamine in pre-mixed bags that come in 400 milligrams and 250 mLs, although you can also find it in 200 milligrams as well as 800 milligrams in that same 250 mLs. And then our dosing is going to be anywhere from 5 to 20 micrograms per kilogram per minute. Now, we can go higher than 20, but at this point, we really kind of run the risk of not really seeing any added support for blood pressure, but the higher the rate goes, the greater the increased risk of tachyarrhythmias. And so since we're talking about the effects, let's actually talk about some of the side effects that we can see with dopamine. And some of the side effects that your patient might experience with this are going to be things like palpitations. They can have nausea, vomiting. Uh, they can get headaches, anxiety, chills, or even shortness of breath. Now, there are some potentially serious adverse effects that we can see, and these are going to include things like those tachyarrhythmias. And this can actually lead to decreased perfusion, which could actually be working against us in some cases. Uh, we can also see ventricular arrhythmias at these higher doses. Uh, we do run the risk of tissue necrosis if we have any extravasation. We can also see asthmatic episodes, uh, as well as potentially anaphylaxis. All right, and so finally, let's talk about the uses that we actually have for this medication in critical care. And there's really two primary cases in which we're going to be using this. We're going to be using it for treating our bradycardia, as well as treating our patients in shock. So when it comes to treating the bradycardia, uh, what we're looking for here is the activation of those beta-1 receptors. And this is going to give us that increased benefit of the increased chronotropy, aka increased heart rate. Now again, we're going to see more of a pronounced effect on the beta-1 activation at those lower doses, uh, but we do also still continue to see this as the doses get higher. So here, typically, our dose is going to be in the 5 to 10 micrograms per kilogram per minute, but again, it doesn't mean that we're necessarily limited to stopping at 10. And because of its benefit in treating bradycardia, dopamine is actually recommended by the American Heart Association as an equally effective alternative to transcutaneously pacing our patients when our atropine has been shown to be ineffective. All right, so now for the treatment of shock, the benefit of dopamine that we're getting here is going to be the activation of both the beta-1 but primarily the alpha-1 adrenergic receptors. So like I said, that primary benefit would be the vasoconstriction from that alpha-1 activation, but we can also see benefit from that increased cardiac output like we talked about, and then the increased perfusion resulting from increasing the heart rate and the stroke volume with that beta-1 activation. Now again, here our dose is typically going to be in the 10 to 20 micrograms per kilogram per minute range. Uh, but we often will start them off at something like 5 and kind of titrate up based on the, the needs of the patient. Now again, remember though, we do run the risk of those tachyarrhythmias and ventricular arrhythmias as we go higher in dose. And so this could really work against us, especially if we begin to get too tachycardic, begin to lose the preload, uh, that filling in between each beat, and then ultimately kind of see a decrease in cardiac output as a result. All right, and that was our review of dopamine. There were several of you guys that had asked specifically for this one, so I hope that you guys enjoyed this lesson. If you did, please leave me a like down below. It really goes a long way to help support this channel in the eyes of the YouTube algorithm, as well as leave me a comment. Let me know what you thought of this lesson. Uh, if you haven't subscribed already, make sure you do so as well, and then also share this lesson with other people you think might find it useful. As always, a special shout out to our awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. The support that you guys offer this channel is truly appreciated. For the rest of you guys, feel free to check out some of the perks that you get for the YouTube and Patreon membership, uh, as well as you can also support this channel by following some of the links down in the lesson description, as well as checking out some of the awesome shirt designs I have down there as well. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson that I release. Otherwise, in the meantime, check out a couple awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.